Hey, hey, welcome to Advancing AI, where we talk all things AI and machine learning. Now, today, I've got a really special treat for you. We're going to be talking all about LLMs in Databricks with a special focus on how we evaluate large language models in Databricks using MLflow. Now, very soon, we'll be joined by Sapi and Will from Databricks, who also authored an incredible blog on evaluating large language models with MLflow to discuss all things large language models, Databricks, and how we evaluate LLMs uh, using MLflow in Databricks. Now, trust me, you don't want to miss this episode. So grab a seat, grab a drink, sit back, hit the subscribe button, and let's get started. Hey, Sappy. Hey, Will. Welcome. Welcome back to Advancing AI. Go ahead and introduce yourselves. Hi, Gabby. I'm so happy to be back after a long pause, summer break, of course, in Europe. Uh, my name is Seppi, as, as uh, your audience uh, might know. Uh, I, I, together with some of my colleagues, have created MLOps Gym series, and you kindly are making videos in this series with us to uh, explain everything that you need to know for doing MLOps on Databricks. Everyone, uh -huh. and my name is Will Smith. I work at Databricks as well. I'm a senior specialist ML architect um, in healthcare and life sciences. So super excited to talk about evaluating LLMs. This has been my life for the last eight months plus. So super excited to share today and hopefully help everybody out with their their you know pipelines and their applications. Thanks for yeah. having me today. Yeah, no problem. Um, no, thanks for being here. I mean, LLM evaluation, right, is such a hot topic and it's constantly evolving as well. So, so tell me, Sapping, well, tell me what's the difference, what's the main difference in your mind uh, between MLOps and LLMOps? Well, there are a, a number of key differences, right? Um, I think the, the, the most obvious one is the type of models and the size of model and data that you have to deal with. Uh, usually when we are talking about LLMs, um, these are models that you're not training every day or every other day, similar to other ML models that you might have. Um, the other difference is that the type of data you're working with is usually different than, than the data that you deal with with classic ML. So there's a lot of text involved. There's a lot of other types of data involved if you, if you don't think about language models only, but other type of models, generative AI models. So that's a, um, another difference. Um, and also you use different training techniques. Right. Um, but with classic uh, ML ops, you you do training and you're done. Yeah. Yep. But with language models, you might need to do fine tuning, which is different than just training. Yeah. You might yeah. uh, use different techniques like RAG and so on, or prompt engineering. That's also another difference. Um, Will, do you have anything else to add to yeah. this? Yeah, I think it's it's interesting because with the traditional like natural language processing, we would do a ton of different pre-processing steps, right? In terms of like stop word removal, um, punctuation removal, lemmaization, stuff like that. And now we're seeing that like you might not have to do that. In actuality, sometimes it might be more difficult because of the the, the actual underlying training data for these models. So. Um, so traditional processes may not apply and we act into like a scalability uh, component where one, um, what dictates a good summarization? Um, you know, standard metrics like rouge and blue uh, may say that, you know, how many of the words exist in the summarization and how many exist in like the actual kind of generated text. And that's not a great metric. And it's very subjective because what one subject um, summary might be good for someone else and one might be good for this. So it depends on, on the application and use case that you're running and how does it uh, work in terms of having those ground truths to evaluate. That's the next step here, right? Yeah. So we have a problem in terms of we don't, it's difficult to generate the test sets um, because if you have someone sit down and make it from scratch, that's, uh, you know, a, a laborious and monotonous task at times. Um, but then how do we do this in a scalable way? Because they are large language models. So we're going to be processing a ton of text and continuously in a way that we could easily become the bottleneck for it. So, yeah. yeah. Cool. I mean, I think you touched on a couple of points there that just leads nicely to the next question that I have. Why, why is it so important now more than more than ever about you know evaluating large language models um, you know accurately and properly? And why should everybody be considering uh, evaluating their large language models? Um, I have a lot of opinions on this, if I may say. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, so I work in healthcare and life sciences and adjacent to financial services. So like <laughs> very much, especially when working with clinical, anything with like diagnosis, prognosis or anything like in a clinical setting, um, the margin of error 
uh, as you would expect, uh, is, is very, very low for the tolerance. Um, we do not want to have any kind of interfacing with a patient uh, that is wrong, especially uh, not ever giving uh, medical like uh, treatment advice. And we also don't want if a patient or, or doctor rather is running on uh, charts to get the wrong condition for a patient and then treat with incorrect assumptions. So um, it's incredibly important to have these uh, in between steps uh, to evaluate and verify, uh, similarly to like code coverage and asserting that things are running the way they should be, uh, to prevent like if someone has bronchitis um, and a doctor is under the assumption that it has they have pneumonia, they will treat it differently and will potentially have uh, worse health outcomes. Um, so incredibly important to have this in the chain, especially when human the loop testing is not possible. Um, yeah. But yeah, that's yeah. my side. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Totally agree. And um, I think the another aspect to this is um, over the years that I've worked in in this industry, the the biggest uh, factor that have stopped people or, or organizations from using AI is the trust that they have in the results of the uh, ML models or AI models. And with language models, it's even more important because people understand the results of language models, so they can read these are words, right? Yeah. And. Yeah. Uh, if as, as the uh, AI practitioner, you cannot prove the results of your model are actually trustworthy, nobody's gonna trust it. And I think it's really important to have that as the first thing that you think about when you're yeah. starting to build yeah. such systems. How can I actually guarantee the results that are produced by yeah. this model or this system is trustworthy? Yeah, I think yeah, you hit the nail there. And it's incredibly important in terms of evaluating a large language model, very different to evaluating you know, in your traditional machine learning models. But instead of us talking about it, I was just wondering whether we can dive into a notebook and just go through an example so people can understand how you'd start to do LLM evaluation in Databricks using, and there's a range of tools available out there, Will, but I'm gonna hand it across to you and, and, uh, and, get, and get a showcase of the demo you have for us today. Awesome, thank you. Uh, let me go ahead and share my screen here. And what we'll start with is um, using MLflow for evaluation. Like you mentioned, there's a lot of tools and there's a lot of frameworks that are coming out and a lot of really great research behind this as an evolving field. Um, MLflow is um, you know the way that we do MLOps at, at Databricks, an open source kind of package that uh, goes across many different kind of frameworks from you know time series forecasting all the way down to hugging face models. So in this case, um, working with uh, a retrieval augmented generation, like set up with a QA chain uh, with Langchain, and then evaluating it for a number of metrics. So going through this uh, relatively quickly, um, what I wanted to highlight is that uh, at Databricks, we have something called Unity Catalog so that we're able to store all of our, our raw data in there, um, but also um, organize our tables in a way of a three-tiered namespace of catalog, schema, and table. Um, with the volumes themselves, I can just put whatever I want in it. So uh, you can use something in terms of the setup lane chain um, to pull these MLflow documents, uh, chunk them appropriately, uh, and then save them to a table to calculate the embeddings later. Um, so that's what I'm doing here in terms of getting the page content, getting them into a document format, and then chunking appropriately to put into my vector store. Um, and so what I mean by vector store uh, is that there is a vector search client that we have that is our vector database that will actually have a number of options, but in this case, going to compute the embeddings in an in incremental fashion so that I will have a uh, optimized vector database to retrieve the appropriate documents from uh, to provide context to my large language model upon whenever I have a prompt. Um, and so here, after I create that as a retriever, all with Langchain, we have a very um, deep integration with Langchain and actually just released Langchain-Databricks as a dedicated package. Um, uh, after I wrap the uh, foundation model APIs in this case, I have a GitHub that also shows using OpenAI as well as customly served models. Uh, Databricks allows you to use whatever LLMs you want. Um, in this case, we actually surface um, a series of APIs with the most popular uh, open nice. source models like Llama 3. Uh, DBRX is our own large language model. It's a mixture of experts. So in this case, um, I'm just going to wrap this with LangChain class. And then here is like really where I guess everything wraps together in terms of actually building the QA chain. And we'll get to the meat of where you really wanted to look at here in terms of yep. evaluation. Yep. Um, so here, once I build the QA chain, um, I'm going to scroll down here. And this is where it really starts to get interesting, where this evaluation data frame is actually a pandas data frame that I created 
uh, manually. So I have a series of questions as well as the ground truth that essentially the LLM will look at and say, yeah. this is the definition of good, right? Whenever there's generation. Um, again, I manually created this. So this was a pure text kind of data frame that yeah. I had to determine my own expertise of uh, wow. what are some good questions and what are some good ground truths that yeah. I would expect the model to do, which is, yeah. is subjective. Um, yeah. I was going to just um, jump in there very quickly, right? I mean, if you, this, this as well, if you don't have any ground to truth, it's not very scalable, is it? So, but there are methods out there to help people generate uh, question and answers pairs. For example, Ragas, generating synthetic data, the back of the documents that we are embedding. I'm not sure there's any other uh, methods that you're aware of, Will and Sapi, but that is something that we use as well to help accelerate that, that ground truth generation for our LM evaluation. And, and I was just wondering, have you used that? Have you, you know, come across um, using Ragas, for example, to generate synthetic data like you have just done here manually? Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Um... The, yep, with with uh, we've actually used Ragas as well as right. DSPy and uh, okay. Langsmith. So tons of different options here, and I think yeah, absolutely, that's the way I think we're going to move forward because it's the only way to start doing these evaluation testing sets in a scalable fashion. Yeah. Like one of the things that I see with different teams that I work with um, is that. At the end of the day, a lot of times it's really difficult to wrangle people and say, "Hey, can you sit down and make this this uh, you know test set for this LLM?" And then doing that once is already difficult. Having someone to essentially maintain an extra asset that they may or may not even you know have the right opinions for, or you know, it's the common human error that like if it's, is it early in the morning that is it after lunch or whatever there's a lot of variables in it that you're basically putting your application that could touch um many 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 people uh in a way that it could be v very affected by various right. factors so absolutely i think that is the way that's going to go and uh, definitely if you're if we have time today i would love to show ragas and show right. how it works yeah. in a in a programmatic way um another quick question if you were doing this say for example you wanted to just test out uh, a manual set of data that you're creating, like you have done here, Will. How many question and answers pairs would you suggest to start off with? Would it be 50, 100, thousands? Is there is there kind of a, a good number there to represent a an evaluation um, data size? Sure. I think, Sethi, you've done this uh, many, many times. Do you mind if I hand that to you and see your opinion on that? Yeah, uh, sure. It depends on what um, you want to evaluate, right? I think the most important thing is that you have a repre representative set of questions. So, for example, if you want your um, chain to be able to answer these five different types of questions, okay. maybe yes and no questions, maybe more uh, creative type of questions, yeah. maybe some uh, retrieval-based questions, uh, so you will have to have representatives of all these type of questions in your uh, set. Now, what is the magic number? Is it 100? Is it 1,000? Is it 10,000? I can't tell you. Okay. <laughs> each use case. The other thing that I wanted to actually to add to this is uh, in terms of creating evaluation data set, if you're working on Databricks, you have a really nice option with um, Databricks agent um, framework. Yeah. Uh, so with the agent framework, uh, you get a UI. So you have an agent, so you create an agent and you can start asking questions to it. Uh, and it gives you a UI to evaluate whether the answer that is generated as a human being, is it good or bad? Right. And all of these are being backed by Unity Catalog. So every question you ask and every feedback you uh, give, it it is recorded in a Unity catalog table that you can later on use as your evaluation data set. So you can open it up to your internal users or external users as tests and let them just go wild with your application right. and then generate the evaluation data set that you would need. Cool. So there's, there's lots of different ways of generating a data set for evaluation. Cool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Absolutely. And on that vein, um, like somebody was mentioning, um, it, it, like it explodes out where you have it so that are you testing your retriever? Are you testing your LM? Is it this task A, B, C? And and having a compound model set up, even if you have like an agentic kind of workload where you have a supervisor, now you have to evaluate is the supervisor routing to the correct LLM? So it, it also adds to the, okay, um, 
it, the simplicity that we're aiming for starts to you know get bigger and bigger in terms of the complexity. Uh, yeah. So I think definitely having a opinionated and like a good foundation to build up to that is pays a lot of dividends in any organization. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I'll end with this one uh, in terms of, like somebody was mentioning too, there are different kind of uh, evaluation uh, criteria and, and different metrics here. So in terms of faithfulness, uh, relevance, and you wrap it all up within a MLflow evaluation here, and you can see that I have faithfulness, relevance, as well as latency metrics. Um, I know we're running on time, so I'll hop over to what I had for Ragas today um, as a framework to help evaluating uh, the rag chains. So showing here, um, all this runs on Databricks, and I can surface these notebooks, absolutely. Um, I do have a GitHub that has a lot of these uh, examples, as well as the, the blog, so um, people can go and run this as they as they like. Um, so we're doing pretty much the same thing as we were with MLflow evaluation for the setup, so I don't want to you know belabor that. Um, one thing that's really interesting with, with Ragas is that um, there's this test set generator um, class, and these uh, generator alum, critic, and embedding, we can do pretty much wrap those however we want um, because it'll take a Langchain um, class. So in this case, I'll actually use a Databricks Foundation model API, uh, but it can also be like an open AI model that is wrapped in a Langchain class. It could be uh, an embedding model or whatever that you may be loaded from Hugging Face and wrapped. Um, and that's the beauty of this where uh, you're not gonna get locked in because of a decision that you made a long time for model selection, which is super, super important. Um, and so after I do all the other kind of groundwork that we went over, um, this is where the magic happens in terms of creating this test set uh, with Rega. So you can see here that this is actually just one line. Uh, I take that generator um, and I'm actually uh, basically telling it how, how big of this test set do I wanna do? And what is the distribution between simple reasoning and multi-context, which are the categories for the actual questions and, and evaluation for it. So simple is obviously just kind of like almost an exact match or you know, key value pair. Um, and then uh, you can get a more and more complex. So showing that we could see here that based on those documents, I was actually able to create this. Whereas before you saw that I you know wrote everything with plain text. Here, this is actually generated, which is awesome too, because if the underlying text changes, you add, you know, update documents, remove them, add them. This will also um, reevaluate and recreate a test set. So it's not like, oh, did we remember to update that data frame? Or did we up, are there new documents that we forgot to add? And then it becomes a mental exercise. Um, and here, so we have this question that was generated. We have the actual original context, which is super useful for like auditing and um, tracing. Uh, and then we have the generated ground truth uh, all the way for like, here is like a, for example, a reasoning here where you can see that it's taking information from this document and it should be thinking in this kind of way. Um, mm. So that's the test set. I'll stop there yeah. for a second. <laughs> yep. I mean, that's that's really cool because if you scroll to the right again, you've got different mm -hmm. categories. You've got your multi-reasoning, which is, I guess, as you can imagine, if, if I was doing this, I'd find it incredibly challenging to come up with a question that's relevant to the document that we're embedding um, that's relevant as well. And, and that is just just aids productivity, right? It just helps you generate different, like you've got simple, you've got reasoning, you've got multi-context. That's quite cool. Yep. Absolutely. And and that's uh, also, like you said, it would be difficult to get into the mindset to do this, but also consistency would be really difficult, right? Because of that. Um, and so uh, having a machine do this. And then one thing that we're seeing too is that um, first pass kind of uh, generation with LLMs and a variety of tasks and having a human expert review and correct that ends up saving a lot of time and still is useful of using expertise yeah. instead of yeah. asking an expert to write things from scratch and then evaluate. Yeah. Um, so absolutely. One thing that I like to add at Advancing Analytics, we've done this as well, and people have come back and debated, well, it's going to be very expensive because we're using an LLM under the hood to generate this evaluation data. But if you can imagine, if you had to employ three, four, five people to do it, I think your cost will escalate very quickly compared to paying an LLM to do this very quickly. I think in 25 minutes, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Will, you can generate hundreds of question answer pairs, and it also shows you exactly from, you know, exactly where it's coming from, from the documents. It's always cross-referencing it, showing that it's generating relevant evaluation data sets. Absolutely, no, 100%. And I think like 
whether, you know, I think the general truth is that a lot of people want to spend their time doing um, things, not necessarily writing documentation. And so even like you, you made a great call out, like not only is it a lot cheaper because we're just, you know, this is a matter of tokens on an API um, and it frees up people so that they can do other things that their expertise, like that's what they want to do and what they should do for an organization. Um, but also in terms of like, even due diligence of documentation, a lot of people may get caught up or there's a meeting or whatever. And then suddenly you have a test set that you uh, may not know where the original doc the text was. Yep. And now it's like, okay, did we just throw that out and we wasted or, you know, th that might not be useful for us. Yeah, mm -hmm. I love this, I love this. So thanks, yeah, thank you for this. Yeah, absolutely. The last thing I'll just say is like we said with the evaluation uh, before, yeah. we can create an evaluation set uh, basically from the LLM itself and then uh, programmatically calculate all these metrics directly within uh, Regas, and then get a nice little table that we can log and then compare between runs. So uh, I know we already went over, so, um, but yeah, thank you so much for having this. And if there are any last questions, happy to answer. Just just to kind of reiterate, all the notebooks will be available and we'll put it down in the link uh, below. And yeah, mm -hmm. thanks, thanks for your time. This has been very, yeah, this has been really good. This has been very insightful and it certainly helps people to understand how to get started. And there's a number of ways. Have you have you got a favorite methodology to do this, Will and Sapi? Well, we love doing things in Databricks, so I use <laughs> the, the agent framework. <laughs> okay, 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 cool. Yeah, likewise, uh, I also like working in Debrick. So uh, I like making, a, honestly, a lot of uh, helper files with a lot of these different packages. But so far, uh, honestly, I've really liked Regas. <laughs> so yeah, I might start might using it in my day-to-day. -day, so <laughs> <laughs> I think, yeah, for me, that, that's been um, my favorite as well. And we've used it um, yeah, quite a lot here as well. So I'm glad you said that, Will. <laughs> <laughs> Purely I, my opinion, no plug. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much for your time today. And thank you for that insightful blog as well, which we'll be putting as reference um, down below. And yeah, we'll see you very soon again. Thank you. Thank Sophie. you for thank having you. us. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for having us. <laughs>